Hi guys, my name is Sonia Kolasińska and I'm a software engineer for like 20 years now. I would like to go through some of the you know, advancements in C++ over years. Uh, using this project I created recently over the last few days, uh, I was showing um, using, using the commit history, um, how would I write it in C++ 98, first with no templates, and later on, I added some templates, and then I started using C++20, okay? So what is this project about? This project is an order book. This is a classical order book. It's fully functional. Uh, it's an order book where you have two sides, bid and ask. So these two sides, uh, what are they? Uh, users uh, send their orders. I want to buy something. I want to sell something. Now, if the order is called limit order, it will be the order placed on the book. Okay. So if I say I want to buy, like say, quantity of 100 for a price of $90 each, then it goes on the bid side as, you know, quantity 100, price $90. Someone else say I want to sell for, um, you know, $100 each, and I want to sell 50 quantity, right? So it goes 50 quantity on this side. Someone else says, yeah, okay, I'm going to sell also $100 each, but 20 quantity. So it, it joins the same uh, level on this book on the, on the ask side. So you have two bid, two, two, off, two offers on the ask side. You have one quantity 50 and second quantity 20, and they're like one after another at the same, at the same level of price uh, 100. And on this side, we had this order quantity, uh, was it 100? And, and the price was 90, right? So if the new new bid arrives, it will join the bid the bids book. If the bid arrives uh, at the price that matches the, the ask side, then the exchange happens. So if the next buy order is at price 100 and whatever quantity, let's say five, quantity five, an order arrives by five at price 100. So normally that will go on the bid book, but because there is a match with ask side, there was a sell sell 50 at 100 and sell 20 at 100. So this bid of five will match this first 50. It will take this five of this 50 and the remaining quantity here will be 45 on the first order and the other order is untouched, right? If another order arrives and it is, well, let's say quantity 100 and it is a limit order to buy 100 at price 100 and say the previous order was five. So this side has 45 and 20 quantity at the price of 100. So this order will match this side, will take this 45 and 20, which is 65. And after that, we have still 35 quantity left. And because this is a limit order, it will actually go on the bid side. So it will go on this side and on the top of the book, which will be above the price of 90 of the previous order, right? So this is how order book works. When there is a match, then there is an exchange. So there is always number of parties involved. You can uh, see that this one order could have matched just one order on, on, the, on the ask side. It could be the opposite. It could be a sell order matching the bid side, right? But we had this first case when we matched quantity of five with quantity of 50. So we took only portion of this quantity of 50, and we realized the full five of this order that is incoming. So this one was fully executed, fully filled, we call it. And this one was partially filled, and it was also executed, right? So there is three terms. There is matching, there is execution, and there is fill. So matching is when two orders match at the same price, uh, two opposite side orders, right? Buy and sell, sell and buy. This is the match. Fill is, you know, the quantity that was filled. So on this order was five, on this one's 50. So this has filled five, which is fully filled because quantity on order was five. And this one was 50, the quantity filled was five. So it was partially filled, the 45 is left. So that's a fill. Now, execution is a different thing. So once these orders get classified as, okay, we can fill this amount on this order. We go to execution and say, can we actually can we actually execute these orders? So we check if this owner of this order, this person, because it's just not numbers, it's 
we exchange apples for bananas. So, you know, does this person have these apples? Does this person have these bananas? Can they actually do the exchange? So we create execution if this is all correct. But this person doesn't have those bananas. They said order 50, but they only have three. So we have to clip the order to only three, right? So the remaining two have to match the next order. And this has to be canceled because this player seemed to be lying and he only has three quantity, not 50. So his order goes away and we have quantity of 20. Let's see what it says. It says here that we have a simple and intuitive implementation of the order book. Order book uh, obviously you know, stores um, orders on, on sides, uh, which have those levels of prices. So we, we want it to be you know, generic. So we will have this order type. It is up to you to decide what your order type is, right? And there is this order concept that we say this order type must conform to. So you can define whatever order you type you want. It can be your order type as long as it follows the order concept rules, right? Then there is an order book side. So that's important for the book because book needs to know how to add an order to a side and how to match an order with the side. Book doesn't need to know anything more than that. So this is the only requirement that order book side would need to have from the book perspective, right? And then we have some extra information about it. Now, let's go back to C++ 98, where we didn't have the concept of order type. We just define a struct order. That's it. It's just, just order, okay? And just side. Let's, let's do that. So we need to go back in time. So we go to um, commit, okay? And we scroll back through all of this. And we see first iteration. Let's see that first iteration. We have some diff here. Let's just go to the branch. Browse files. That's a button we need to press. Now in this browse files, we'll have this order book from this commit where it was, you know, first initial, um, you know, import, right? When I did, I put everything as as uh, headers. So and we only have one header at this stage. I did the split later on because you know, easy way of doing things, right? Um, so this is my header. This is my whole order book at the first iteration and it didn't have matching so don't be surprised so we had uh, defined uh, the side the type so we have buy or sell we have four types of orders so we have market limit ioc and foc market means order price is determined by exchange whatever is on top of the book so if i'm buying quantity of 10 whatever is the price on the top of the book um, you know this will be used a limit order specifies the price. So that's a limit at which I want to buy. So I say I want to buy at a at price no higher than $120. And there is number of orders at prices 100, 110, and then 120, and then 130. So my order will not get matched against the 130, but it will get matched 100 against those other orders, right? From, from, from 90 to 120. IOC works the same. The only difference between IOC and limit is that limit will leave quantity on the opposite side if there is anything unexecuted. So if you say, I want to order 50 and you didn't fill all the 50, you only filled 30, the remaining 20 goes you know, on the other side, on the bias, bit, on the bit side. The uh, FOC is essentially the same thing as IOC. It's just IOC will be canceling only the quantity that uh, was not filled and FOC it's only like either all the, all the quantity is filled or, or it's just canceled. We don't feel anything, okay? So as of now, I have not implemented FOC and market because, uh, you know, FOC will be additional work to think about with a transaction required for this to happen. So I need to scan through order book to see, okay, I will fill these levels. Do I have enough quantity on the book to fill this order? Can I fill this order? Does execution policy allow me to fill this order fully? If so, then I say, okay, commit. If not, then roll back and all the orders have to go back as they were. So they shouldn't be matched, right? So FOC is transactional. Market will require me to pick the price from top of the book and, and, and fill the order with that, with that price. Now, the question is, should I pick just the top top of the book or should I fill the full quantity of a market order? That's a good question. Um, now, maybe there should be a different type of market order, market order that, you know, 
scans through a number of levels to get uh, to the quantity required. So quantity, quantity priority or price priority, where you say, we just want the top price, that's it, right? Now, here we go. The definition of instrument and market. Later on, I decided that these two are actually irrelevant for my book because I don't do anything with them. It's just an information from the user. So it's a future version. It's a current version, like future from this commit perspective. Uh, I don't have those because you can create your own definitions yourself, whichever way you like. So you can, you can use your definition of an instrument, your definition of a market. You just need to create an instance of my order book for each market you want to trade on and you want to you know tell me what the order is but uh this this are I, I i'm not concerned about those two it's 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 you and your execution policy that interested is though my I, my book is not interested right so your execution policy may look into instruments traded and say oh no, these are the limits whatsoever you know you can you can throttle things so you can decide in execution policy what you want to do with executions my book doesn't do that my book just says this was executed, execution policy. Can you confirm how much was executed, right? Now, in this version, we don't have that yet. So don't worry about this. Order is those things. It's market, it's side, order type, price, and quantity. As I said, market goes away in new versions. Order quantity is a reference to an order plus the quantity. So you can see that order itself is an original order that you made, right? So you order 50. An order quantity is what, what rests on a book. So if you ordered 50, uh, then if it didn't match anything, then the order quantity will be 50 on the book. But if it matched, let's say 20, and it was 20 was executed, then the remaining quantity will be 30. And on the book, you'll have order quantity 30, and the original order will be unmodified. But this is quite a good solution, I think, because we have the original order. With my, my book doesn't touch your objects. It doesn't touch them. It's, it's your objects. We don't touch them. I have my own state here, and I refer to your objects. That's it. And I don't manage them. This is your objects. It is your problem to manage them. I just refer to them. Okay? So I don't use smart pointer. I just use a reference which says, okay, you gave me this object. So you, I trust you that you will keep this object forever until you tell me to take it out. I actually don't have a cancel order function yet, so you have to keep it forever. Um, then there is order price level. So we said that book consists of sides and side consists of from levels. So let's go scroll down to see what the book is. So we have a book here at the bottom. So book is just a class with two sides. You can see order book side bit and ask. Actually, they're defined in here, right? They are the same type in this version of code. And the side is defined at constructor. We say bid is constructed with buy. Ask is constructed with sell as a parameter for construction. So this is a runtime runtime property of being a buy or sell, a runtime property. So this will require the site to do runtime checks, what side it is when I'm trying to do things with orders on the side. Then the book has accept order function. Okay, this is a function that user calls on the book. You send an order using this accept order function. And then depending on the side, we call either bid or ask to add the order. This is straightforward and simple, but in the future, we'll see that this code becomes more complex and we need a little bit of more templates here. Let's go see uh, what happens next with this version of the code. In this version of the code, we have order book side, as we, as we said here. And this order book side at this version of code is a deck. Why deck? Because deck gives you random access. Why do I need random access? because I want to use uh, lower bounds, right? I want to use lower bounds so that I can keep the side sorted uh, when I insert orders into the book, okay? So I use lower bound to find an insertion point. So you can see I'm finding this insertion point. So finding a level at which this order should be added or finding a place in between two levels already existing to add a new level for this order. And I insert that new level if, if I don't find it, right? But I know exactly where because my deck is sorted. And then I add the order to that place, whether to this new level or to the existing level, right? So th this, is, this is kind of efficient algorithm because you have a log n uh, search time. So that's a lower bound, log n, right? And, uh, and then 
you have insertion at constant time because we already have iterator. So this insertion is constant time and this is DEC. So it's, it's a linked list of small arrays. So that, that makes it, you know, that makes it a constant time insertion mostly, right? Now, what do we have next? We can see that DEC is of order price levels. So we can see that we have two sides in the book. We have two sides and each side has a DEC of levels, right? So what is the level? Level is per price. So we have the level. Uh, here we have level, right? And this level has a price. And we can see that we also have a DEC of, of, of our order quantities we said. So for each order, we said there is a quantity we keep on the book. So unexecuted quantity, right? So we have this deck of unexecuted quantities of orders. And for this level, we have a price of that level so that we know that this level is $400 and another level is $420. So another thing, how do we, how do we sort order, order book sides? We know that bids and asks are sorted opposite, right? We know that big bids on the top have the highest price. And then the deeper we go, we have the lower price because on the top of the bid, you want to have a best price for the sellers. So the seller comes and say, what, what can I buy it for? The best price for the seller is the you know, highest price. And on the ask side, you have the opposite. You have top of the ask side is the lowest price. So the buyer comes and says, what is the best price for me to buy something? And the buyer wants, wants the lowest price. So this is the, the lowest buy price on the top of the sell side. So the asks. And the asks go like kind of this direction, right? So the higher price is here. So if you put the order book like two sides like this, then you have lowest price here, highest price here. And somewhere in the middle, you have bid and ask, and you have this so-called spread between bid and ask. So the, the, the lowest possible price that's on the ask side and the highest possible price that's on the bid side, right? You have this gap. So how do you um, achieve this uh, opposite sorting? So as I said, I'm using DEC. DEC is not a sorted collection. So when I'm inserting something into that DEC, I'm making sure that I'm inserting in a correct position so that it's sorted. So if this is my DEC and I have new item. So DEC of price levels. This, I, this is, let's say, $90. This is $200. And I have $120. Where do I put this in? I put this in the middle between $90 and, $100 and $200. If I now have... Um, so now we have three. Now, if I have $150 order, I put it here between 200 and 120, right? So, so that's how I get it sorted by inserting into correct spots straight away. And then I, I have a sorted deck. But how do I know the ordering when I sort it? Like, how do I know which way does it go? I, I use this uh, function here. I could use Lambda, which I'll show you on the next commit. But uh, in this version, C++ 98, we didn't have lambdas. So what did we do in C++ 98? We created a class. Uh, in C++, there is no difference between class and stroop. By convention, and I think it was more like uh, inherited from boost uh, way of doing things, or maybe standard library, you know, struct was used for like things like functors and algorithms, I suppose, I don't know. Uh, you can see that my compiler has three overloads of uh, comparison because when we put this comparer into this lower bound, the lower bound will be comparing whatever is in your range begin end with your, with your value. Value is an integer in this case. So I use integer prices in this particular commit. And this range will be something else. This, this range is a range of those. It's a range of you know, order price levels. And order price levels are not integers. You can compare order price levels with integers. So I need to have a comparison between order price level and integer, as well as the other way around, integer and order price level, as well as order price level and order price level. You can see this is fully redundant code. We will fix that, I promise you, okay? But I'm just showing you how would it be done with no templates, like zero templates, just pure, pure C++ 98 with no templates. And Visual Studio 6 in 2000, it didn't really support templates very well. Well, it would handle this situation though, but we'll get back there, okay? So let's see what I did in the next comment. 
So this is a div between the last commit I showed you and the next commit. So you can see that I'm starting to use C++ 20 stuff. I think auto was introduced, you know, quite earlier than that, but auto as a return value without declaring type here, this decal type, I think it was introduced, uh, was it 20 or 17? Not sure when it was introduced, but it is a C++ 20 feature now. So I'm not using this explicit, you know, return time definition anymore. I just say auto. It looks like Python now, seriously. But yeah, fine, it's statically checked, okay? Compiler is checking types, you know, at compile time, it's static type check. So it's good, it's auto, but when I use it, it's, it's checked. So it's not exactly Python. Um, I replace this other quantity ampersand and cost of the quantity ampersand, which cost auto ampersand and auto ampersand. So that's actually a way to tell a compiler that, you know, this auto returns something probably by value. We don't know. This here will guarantee that it is returned by reference. And this is a const reference, guaranteed that it is a const reference. That's a const function to return from, right? So this is one change. So use auto, that's one thing. Um, I introduced this inline function that you know tells what would be the price if I put an integer. It says integer. What would be the price of an order if I if I say order? It would be x dot price, right? What would be the price if I said price level? It would be x price uh, called of the function price, right? So we generalized the way we access the price, the value of price, and now we can go ahead and do something more. So we can see that uh, we removed this, this compare comparator uh, structure, this functor, we removed it, right? It's actually multifunctor because it has multiple overloads. Um, so we removed it and uh, what we did next is we used here in our lower bound, we used lambda here. See this lambda. So we capture this. This is what we captured. And in C20, we have auto. Like, I mean, every other C between 11 and 20 wasn't so cool. This is the coolest C ever. Auto everywhere. Just, just put auto, right? We don't know what it is, it's auto. Well, I don't know if it's a good practice to make auto everything. This is why I'm not doing auto everything all the time. But this sounded like a right choice here because, you know, it's auto. And cool thing about it is it's actually a multi-lambda function because if it is, an, you know, I'm passing here one function, but because it's auto and this time, this, this lower bound is going to be looking for those three overloads, you know, it's going to be looking for these three overloads. It's going to be looking for comparison order price, order price, price, order price, order price, price. But because it's, you know, auto, it creates, it makes it a template. And when it you know, executes this template, it just, you know, passes the correct parameters. But for, for this function, for this code to work correctly, I had to introduce this price of helper function, which will unify access to those objects A and B. If there are integers, we know how to compare integers, but if there are something else, we have to have this utility function that, you know, this calls. And now we call an, an overload of this function, right? So for order price seven, it calls this overload. For, for integer, it calls this overload, right? So we have this, you know, lambdified version, uh, lambdified version of, of our, um, you know, lower bound, right? All right, guys. So let's see what's next. So we had this lambdified version of our compiler for our lower bound, but we still were doing this uh, runtime check of whether this side is bid or ask. How about we make it more static? So approach number one is to use virtual function. And you know, natural would be to have two different types for the bids and ask and have a virtual function for bids different than for, for the asks. Let's see the approach. So this is the commit where I'm separating bid and ask size. Let's see at the bottom what happened here. So in previous fashion, we had accept method that takes an order, depending on the side, we take either bid or ask side and we call add order with the order, okay? And both sides were of the same type called order book side. 
And in this change, what I've done is I have created new types for bit side and ask side. There is order book bit side and order book ask side. The two different types. But I made them have same base class, order book side. And you can see now the function that does something with the sides is accepting the base class. This gives me the space to add more code here, more logic that I will not have to repeat in here. So my accept order is now delegating the call to do accept order, passing the correct side, depending on the side of the order. But then the actual logic, you know, is here in this method that uh, takes advantage of the base class. So let's see what happened uh, with, with the order book side class, because obviously it has to be slightly different for bids and slightly different for ask. We can see that the order book does no longer construct the uh, the order book sides passing the, the side as a parameter. So the sides are default constructed. Previously, it had to be there because both sides were of the same type. Now the sides are, are dif of different type. So the, the type itself encodes uh, the, the ordering of the side, right? But obviously, I did not want to repeat the code for those sides. So what I did is I had a base class. Let's see it. Look what, what the base class is doing. So the base class order book side now has this new virtual method to find the point of insertion. So all the logic that we had is the same. We just need to find a spot where in the book we should be inserting this new level if it doesn't exist, or to find existing level, right? Depending if it's ask or bit side, the search will go up or down. Now, let's see the implementation of this virtual method for both sides. And we can see that implementation for the bit side is using a lower bound with the lambda, which is much simpler now. Let's check, take a look at the old lambda. Old lambda was doing a comparison of the side, right? So if side is by, then do this, otherwise do this. And this comparison will be done, you know, this, this will be done unnecessarily for every single pairs that lower bound is comparing. So uh, completely unnecessary and hitting performance, right? In this case, we have uh, this virtual method override, which, which takes that particular implementation that says price of A needs to be less than price of B, period. And in, on the bit side, you know, we have price of B less than price of A. So we can see these are two opposite comparisons and they are coded into the code of the side. So book side, bit side has comparison like this. And the ask side is comparison like this. So we can see that it's static from the compiler perspective. Compiler, when it compiles this type, will always compile it like this. There will be no, no check what the side is, right? So let's see how we can achieve static polymorphism. Because so far, we have achieved a runtime polymorphism. We had two classes with a base class and virtual method in the base class implemented in those two subclasses. We can achieve similar polymorphism at compile time, right? So this is this is my static polymorphism first commit. So what did I do here? How do I achieve static polymorphism? Well, step number one, uh, replace base class and subclasses with maybe some templates. And here's what I have here. We have order book side by and order book side cell, okay? So it sounds like I have just one template and it takes side as a parameter. Let's see how this works. So now we have order book side that indeed takes template parameter of type side. Side is an enum. So it's not a type parameter, it's just a value, constant value parameter. And it is constant value because you can see here we say by or sell, they're constants, right? From the enum. And next thing we see is that our find.get insert iterator, right? will use this functional object here. So we no longer use lambda. Why? 
Let me show you why, what happened, what is this price level compare? And you can see it's a template also taking the side. So, so far, everything is static. This is static, you know, constant. So let's see at this functor here. So I can see price level compare is a template with constant side. And then we use const expression. And I think this is the perfect use of const expression. When we have something like this, we want to say, okay, we have this functor and we have two flavors of it, depending, you know, on some constant. And then instead of implementing, you know, you could you could achieve the same thing in C plus plus ninety eight using specialization. You could say price level compare and it depends on side parameter, and I have a specialization for buy and specialization for sell, or I have just specialization for buy and the sell is a default, right? So you could use that with template specialization in C plus plus ninety eight. You didn't have to have any of this, you know, perks of C plus plus twenty, but here we can use const expression, which achieves the same goal, and you don't have to implement two classes. You can just have one and all in one place. I think this is a wonderful use of const expression, right? So what happens here is our order book side becomes simple again, but now our lower bound is using this functor, passing in the side at compile time, Right, So we pass in the parameter. This is a compile time parameter. And we pass it here to this template. And then this const expression will choose which version we're going to be using at compile time. So if we're calling in our order book, you know, to add order on this bit side or ask side, right? We call it here. Compiler knows the type of this. And it calls this method add order, which does do add order implemented below this find. The reason for doing this is because there is a note here that this auto couldn't be resolved properly by compiler if I did it here. I needed to put the order that order below below this, this function. But bottom line, I'm calling this statically. Compiler knows I'm a bit side, for example. I was I was called from a bit side. So so this is beat side. So we're going here, we're going here, and this is a, you know, compile time known that, that we're doing this. So we're essentially gonna take this fragment of the code. Compiler will not be doing this per each operation if it's not gonna be like every time lower bound compares to elements, it checks if it's which side it is. No, it's not gonna be that case. In this case, we will have compiler choose the version and that version will go for lower bound uh, to, to be used for all comparisons, right? And you can see it is a template as well, because as we said earlier, we will be comparing prices of order price levels and prices of value and so on. So we have three variants. So, so that's how we how we solve this, right? So this is this is the version with uh, static polymorphism. What can we do more here? So in this next step, I have introduced this order type, which, which will now, let's see what happens, you know, which will now satisfy a concept. So I declare this concept. Let's see why do I declare this concept. Let's, let's look at the code first below that uses it. So we have this order that we used to be using, and we can keep it for now. It's not a problem to have it, but we introduce the order type, you know, into our book side. So now our book side is no longer using the concrete order type as before. We're no longer using this structure order. Now we're using some order type that user provides. And we can see here something new, something C++20, something just amazing. So the same type, you know, the same way you, you, when you have a function, right? When you have a function, you have a type and the name of a parameter of a function. In the same way, now in C++20, you have a concept, concept of a type and type. So this is like a second order type, right? It's a type of the type, <laughs> super type. So we now say that in this template, we expect this type order type to be of concept order concept. Meaning that later on when I use it, 
I'm using this order type everywhere, but it conforms to this concept. So whatever this type is, it has to follow the specification of order concept. Does it not sound some familiar? Yes, it does. If you were to do it at runtime, this order concept will be simply an interface. And then this concrete type would be an implementation of that interface, right? But we're doing it at static time, right? So at compile time. So what happens is we define this interface as a concept. So it is exactly the same thing as an interface, besides the fact that this is called concept now, and it is an interface of a type that you're going to pass into your uh, into your template, right? So this type implements this interface, this concept. It's a static compile time interface, which is just amazing. And the way we work with those, it's exactly the same. So, so it is an interface that's resolved during compile time and not the interface that's resolved during the runtime. The rules are simple. Keep it as small as possible. We have interface segregation rule in the solid principle. Interface segregation means keep your interface concise. Just focus on what you need. Don't put into your interface too much. Also, Liskov principle would say, you know, you don't want to have situations that subclass, you know, any subclass cannot be substituting the base class, right? It's a substitution rule that, you know, a base class, uh, a reference to a base class can be substituted by any subclass. So we don't want a situation that they don't implement the full interface correctly, like sometimes may happen if we have too many things in the interface. If our interface is concise and small, then we focus on what we need. And this is why we call it requirements. And this is a very good, actually, convention for naming here. Maybe we should use the same you know, way of uh, thinking about interfaces, because re interface is a set of requirements, and it is a concept of something, right? It's a runtime concept, and concept is a sort of compile time of, of, of something. So what we have here, here we have uh, the requirements for this concept. The requirements say we have defined a type, type name, inside the T. So the T is an order, we say any T satisfies this order concept. So if we if we think of concept as interface, then any T would be implementing it, right? Any T implementing this concept would need to have this price type defined, and we need to have this quantity type defined, right? As well, they need to be of numeric type. They need to satisfy numeric type uh, concept that I have defined here, which says it's an arithmetic type. On top of that, we have two additional requirements which say any X, which is this T that implements the concept. So anything that implements this concept, concept, right, has to have a price and quantity as a accessible this way. So, you know, whether it is a field or in C++, you don't have many choices, right? It can only be field if it's like this. But you can make it a proxy field or something. It has to eventually convert itself to a price type. So it does not need to be a price type on its own self. In C++, we have implicit constructors. We have type conversion operators. We can have a proxy type. And that proxy type could, for example, have an operator that converts itself into price type, right? So, you know, it, it, it is anything with the name price. So X has something with the name price. And that thing can be implicitly converted into price type. And quantity that can be implicitly converted into quantity type, right? So this is our requirement. And if you look at the order we defined some time ago, it satisfies this requirement because um, it does in fact have um, these properties, right? Does it? It does because this is collapsed code. Oh, here we go. Price and quantity. I got misled by GitHub. <laughs> so yeah, so this, this order is satisfying these requirements. And you can see from the requirements that we only care about price and quantity. And perhaps I should have added a requirement for 
side and order type because they will be needed. And I might have done it in later version. I'm not sure, I'll check it later. So let's see what happens here. Uh, we have this order concept used in our order book as well. So obviously because order book side is now parameterized with this order type, then order book itself has to be parameterized as well because it creates instances of order book side. So, you know, they also have to be order concept. But nothing actually stops you from putting here type name and then let the order book site worry about concept. <laughs> if you do that, it will still work. It's just, you know, user will be seeing the details of your implementation. So this order book site is actually not something that we want to expose much to the user, right? The user of this whole solution uses order book. And the only method that they ever use is accept order at this iteration of development. There is this ask and be it here that re re returns this order side, but maybe it returns a, an object that user knows what to look into this object, and maybe it doesn't need to be this concrete data type from the user perspective. Maybe user can just see some, that they can use some methods. We get back to that later when we introduce a concept of orders. So other book site concept looks like this. It requires that there is a type defined order type inside this order book site type, and that this order type is implementing order concept, which is defined here, right? And then it also requires that there is functions and methods add order. And this add order is a method of something that implements order site concept and takes as a parameter an order type reference, right? It takes order type reference. I can see that I'm using here decoval. This this is a way to you know to dec to, to create a type, an instance of this of this thing. So it's actually an instance of a reference of order type reference. Um, and so that we can pass it into this method. This is concept, so this is not going to be called or anything like this. This is just to, for compiler to match the types. You know what it will do? It will just say, okay, we have this method and we call it with this parameter of this type, and it's all okay. It all compiles, and then we say that this method should return something that converts to nothing to void. So a method that returns void should should match this this thing, right? In, in C++ 98, we were using similar thing uh, to this decal It's not like working only in C++ 20. In C++ 98, I would define like, I actually took it from C++ journal, I believe, or maybe modern C++ design, the make T, the make T um, static method, which essentially, you know, creates a reference from nowhere because if you put this make thing inside of size of, you know, the, the compiler will not be actually calling this method. It will just, you know, tell at compile time the size of, of you know, the result you, you're trying to achieve. So it will tell you if certain expression would evaluate to this or that in at compile time, right? So this decal isn't isn't C20, you know, novum. It, it is there in a standard library now. But we used to use that, uh, you know, long time before that happened. Um, and then we have a side as well. So let's let's see wh why we why we need this other side book side concept. So we need this other book side concept because our do accept order is gonna be taking this side type, and this side type we want it to satisfy this other book side concept, so that in this method here we can access those two sides you know, uh, through these methods, um, you know, add order, and if you want it side, right? It's it's not like we wouldn't be able to use any other methods, but it is a good practice, I suppose, to specify what we require. Because if we, require, if we access a method that is not in the list here, uh, our compilation error will be very, very long and if we specify that method and we don't have it in this object that we try to use, 
uh, we get much shorter error message saying that we're trying to pass some type here and it does not satisfy the concept. And this is super cool because I remember at C++ 98, I was getting 100, 100 pages of errors. 100 pages, yeah, you had to scroll, scroll, you could you can keep scrolling. And, you know, I, I used to just do pipe head 20 or something to just see the beginning of this error because like, I, I didn't even know what's going on. 100 pages of errors, come on. <laughs> so this is such an improvement of life, I'd say. Okay, let's let's go to the next one. So the next step for me to do was to take advantage of this new um, order type and book side and, you know, add more template parameters to other things. Like, for example, uh, you know, my order quantity now is a template of order type. And I say, obviously, order type has to be satisfying order concept. So my code now does not use type name practically at all. So in all cases, we have like order itself got a template as well. I say it's a numeric type for price. It's a numeric type for quantity. This way, this order is flexible. You can say, I want to use some numeric type decimal or something, you know, and you're free to do that. I'm not stopping you. You can put here anything that is according to STD library, uh, you know, it's arithmetic and 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 then we, we're happy to go. We can use use that type of yours and good, you know? So now we have an order with this price type and quantity type that's numeric type, but if that type is changing, then everything is changing because we had these price comparisons and, you know, we have to change all of that. So what happens next is, you know, we, we put this order type in all other classes. We make like order price level a template or the quantity, a template, and so on. And we introduce a price trade, okay? I introduce a strict price trade, which which takes uh, different, uh, you know, template parameters. This is a specialization for this type, so I must have defined it earlier. Oh, here it is. So I defined, uh, I defined a price trade, which takes some T and a numeric type for the price. So initial, um, idea was that we're going to say, what is the price uh, of, for, like, how do we extract price from the T? And we just want to say, what is the type type of that price itself? So by default int, but if, as I said, you could use decimal. So you want to extract a decimal from your order of type T. Later on, I found out that this was uh, a, a bug. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, of course, I made a mistake here. Although this this shows you the partial specialization of templates, so you can see that I have two template parameters, and then I see I say price trade, and we have numeric type for price type, and we have price type price type, or we have a price trade for order type, and then the second parameter is order type price type, or the the third specialization would be uh, as we had later on here. Um, it was price trade for other price level of order type. So this is for the price level. And then we have this price type here passed as well. So, so that's, um, that's, that's how these specializations are defined. And the mistake I have made in this whole logic is that, um, this, this function that I, where I use this price trade, uh, it also has this second parameter, but it cannot be deducted because um, I'm not passing it anywhere and I'm not telling it what it is. So it was defaulting to int for all the cases and I did notice it until I created a test for double stuff. <laughs> so that's that's a funny one anyway. But yeah, that's a slightly over-engineered piece of code, uh, which was then simplified. And I probably over-engineered some pieces on the go and then I under reverted it to something simpler. So as we go, we simplify and we notice that we did something wrong and we undo it, do it better and we fix it, right? So yeah, so we have this price trade, we have this price of which uses price trade. So now I can say the price of anything, anything that has a price trade. If I don't have a price trade for it, I do write a price trade for it. And then I know the price of the thing. You can have a price of whatever object you want. And then we have everything working nicely because 
we have our um, order book using template order type parameter, then order type itself is now defining us uh, those two types, price type and quantity type, right? And now I can use this price type as my, you know, for example, here, I can say order type, price type, right? So I, can, I have to say type name so that compiler knows that this price type is a type name because otherwise it would not know what that is. Uh, funny thing, uh, Visual Studio in six, in 2000, actually didn't care about this type name. We just assumed it was a type. <laughs> so <laughs> it was such a big confusion between GCC and Visual Studio and then versions of Visual Studio and so on. Like, like I'm I'm glad that the times of C plus plus ninety eight and old, you know, age two thousand two thousand five. Like, this all this is all gone because I really hated this firefighting with those templates. Today you have I think quite standardized this, and I kind of like it. You know, I kind of like that all of this is just working and. And I have, don't have to worry that I use a different compiler and things just stop working, you know? I don't know, maybe it's still the case, but right now I'm using GCC, so. And I know Visual Studio is quite conformant. I don't know how much is it conformant with C20, but yeah. All right, let's, let's go ahead with the next version. And this next comment, what I did was I tried to abstract the uh, the types I use, types of containers that I use for for my price levels and my you know stack of uh, price levels. So the side, the book side. Um. So let's let's find it. So we have this order book side now with stack type and queue type, and that has to be passed from from order book. So it, it kind of propagates from the bottom, from order book. So your order book now is having two additional template parameters, which are templates, you know, they they just, so we call that, well, at least at some past, we, we used to call that a second order template. A second order template is a template class that is, you know, not only having template parameters, so that's a first first order, template parameter, but this is the second order template parameter. So you can compare it to function. Uh, so if this order book was a function, then this would be a parameter. This would be type of the parameter, right? And this would be the parameter. And this, this would be a type of a parameter and that would be, you know, a parameter, but the type of a parameter would indicate that it is a function. So a function taking a function, right? So it's a second order function. So that's functional object. Uh, in terms of templates, you know, it's it's template that take, takes template. <laughs> so you can see we take a std deck, not a std deck of something, but std deck, just, just deck, just like this. Like it's deck itself is a template class. So we say that we pass a template class as a parameter. You can see that I had a difficulty defining a concept for it. Now, I want to make a complaint to the creators of C20 standard and say, you didn't think about it. Maybe you did, I don't know, but we do have second order templates and we do not have second order concepts. We don't have concept for, like I, I cannot define a concept of this, of template. I can only define a concept of concrete type. So, you know, that's that's such a shame. And second thing, I, I cannot you know use concepts in template parameters of concepts, which is also sad. But we 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 kind of know that it's hard thing to do. I cannot pass a concept as a parameter type inside of a concept requirements. This is also something um not necessarily beautiful, you know. So so yeah, um, maybe there could be some magic done in C++ to, to guess all these things. You know, I believe that co compilers should be able, like we're guessing auto everywhere. We, we could guess all this, you know, make some default fake implementation of the concept, uh, you know, in the air that, you know, it's only compiled them, you know, something that we can just pass a concept instance as a, as a parameter. 
or, 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 or as a template parameter or something like that. So yeah, um, so that's that's what I'm sad about that there is no concept for this, but I found a workaround. Don't worry, there is a work there is a workaround for this coming. It's my latest comment. So so yeah, so we're passing here a template as our parameter, and the reason for that is, well, I'm using this deck of decks. How about you want to use uh, vector of vectors, deck of vectors? I don't know vector of lists, something like that. So some of these types will work, some of these types don't work. For example, if you wanted to use std set of, say, vectors, yeah, that will not work in this version of this code. So let's look what we did here. We have order book side with, um, you know, stack type being a template and Q type being template. And then as expected, instead of saying std deck, we say stack type here and we have this second order template being actually applied to a particular type, which is order price level and passing template parameter as a, a template as a template parameter. So it's it's an actual type right now because this will resolve to actual type as well. If we look to the order type, yeah, we can see that this is a template, but eventually this becomes a, a type and we have a queue with this particular type and this queue type is gonna be our, you know, the guy we passed here. So we have a deck of decks, but we can change it to vector of vectors or something. No problem with that. Or the list of lists will not work because this has to be giving random access for the lower bound. Lower bound doesn't work with the list. Okay, so that's gonna be this version. In the next version, I try to address the problem of what if I wanted to do std set of std vectors? Why do I have to use std deck and lower bound? std set has its own lower bound, right? So maybe maybe I want to go that way. And I introduced something called lookup policy somewhere here. Let me find it. Price lookup traits. This is how I call it, right? So price lookup traits. And then I have this policy. Standard lower bound price level poor lookup policy. And this would be using std lower bound. And then I try to have one for, you know, for std set somewhere. Not sure if I ever committed it because it never worked. It never worked because it wasn't so simple. But we can see that price level lookup policy for vector happens to be standard bound, lower bound for deck standard lower bound. So I think what I started to think about, why do I have to specify this? Why do I have to specialize for vector and deck? Why can I not say, I would like a, this to be my default policy, lookup policy for anything that matches concept of random access, right? Random access container, then I'm using this. And if something matches a concept of, but I'm an, a set or a container with lower bound method, maybe there is a different policy for that, right? So. So, you know, I wanted to do that, but you cannot specialize, you know, actually I could have, yes, I could just put it here. <laughs> I just realized something. Anyway, let's, let's go ahead and see what happened here. So that's, that's actually, I added some t test changes to the test. Um, what did we do? I think I tried to, to test with deck of vectors here. Um, where is the pi find policy? Oh, this is our find policy now here. So we implement the find get or insert iterator using this find policy. So I say find policy is my price level lookup traits value of the stack type. So we know that this resolves to this find policy we defined here, which is standard lower bound price policy. I had the one for STD set, but it wasn't working because was like I couldn't, couldn't make it work yet. So I didn't commit it. And, and then we call find or get insert iterator, right? So that's, that's our change. And, and this way, you know, our, our type of this, of the stack could be more flexible. It wouldn't have to be, you know, random access container. It could be something, whatever trade style it is. 
the, the only problem is there were small problems with that because of the side, right? Because of the side. So if I wanted to use lower bound of the STD set, then I would have to actually define, um, you know, the type for my storage. So this stack type would be, I would have to have a parameter with compiler and that's, that's probably why I, I abandoned this idea at this stage. Nice uh, evening sun now. I really like what I see to the window. All right, let's see what's next. Um, it sounds like I split things into files now. Um, so yeah, I have concepts in separate file. Um, I actually use the unified if for this. Oh, here we go. That's my concepts. So I have order concept and order book site concept. That's the only concepts I have at this stage of the development. I define the um, the enums, so book side and market. I, I think I removed the instrument, the market, they weren't needed anymore. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, all this has been moved. So now we have order book. So the order book is having now order and order book. So I think the, the order book header is something that is for user to, to use. So this is a header you can include. And then the price tag level is something that's kind of internal details of how the order book works, right? And um, if there is another implementation ever in the future, then it's going to be like maybe other file or something. And, and you can pass it using this order book site policy, maybe a different policy for for, for our book site, right? So now I'm using stack of order queues, which is essentially a class with a, which is a stack of, of the levels. And then order queues are those, those levels. And stack of order queues is basically uh, by default a deck of decks. So because deck is perfect for both things, but deck is perfect for stack and deck is perfect for, for the queues, right? Why, why am I even using deck uh, of decks? Um, because I wanted a stack of queues. When you execute orders, and this is this is what it is about, executions should be the most performant actions here in the system, right? You want orders to execute quickly. So for that, you want some data structure that has constant time for iteration from the top of the book down to the next levels. And nothing is more suitable for this purpose as stack, like order book has two sides. And by definition, those sides are just stack of levels. So why not to use, you know, structure that is suitable for a stack, right? I'm using lower bound as an algorithm to, to choose where I insert new level. But because this is a deck, the insertion time is also relatively constant. So I have a log n because I need to find the position. So Algorithmic complexity would be like similar to STD set or B tree, so it's it's also the same you know same thing. The only difference is though when I execute, when I execute, I don't have to go you know logarithmic complexity to the to the leaf to to reach the top of the book. I get the top straight away, and that's the benefit of deck. Also, memory allocation is in constant size blocks, right? Because deck consists of those small arrays linked together like linked list. However, deck can be accessed using random access. So, so that's you know, that's the benefit of, of deck over list. So it's kind of good versatile data structure for, for the order book, isn't it? Deck of decks, because then a level is also a deck, a queue, right? You want to pop from the front. And what's better for that than, than deck? Um, we could argue that deck maybe is not as good as vector for this. I don't know. Some people may be using a list. I don't know. Um, I prefer deck of decks in this stage, but I think uh, I would like to see an implementation of B3 of decks or B3 of vectors to see how that one will compare in performance wise. But I would need to have more complex system to test it. I'd have to have some kind of test with huge load and lots of orders. And, you know, I don't have that yet. So at this stage, deck of deck works for me. So in this next step, 
I have added the match function to the uh, order book site concept. So now order book site concept has add order and match. And in the order book, I'm using this, you know, generalized do accept order. So now you see why it is good for me to delegate into the, this do accept order from original um, from original accept order. So you are calling accept order on the on your order on your book order book. And this takes your order and delegates it to accept order. Now you can see there is two parameters in the do accept order. And I need those two parameters. And you see that depending on the side, they are swapped. So it's either ask and bid or bid and ask. And those parameters are there so that I know that if the order comes, comes in, I want to match it. If it's a buy, I want to match it against the ask. And if I don't find the match, I want to put it on the bid. If it's a sell, I want to match it against the bid and the reminder of the order goes on the ask, right? So this is exactly what I'm doing here. And I don't think you can do it any simpler than that. So first we, we match the quantity of the order. So we say we have an order, we order 100. Match will say, okay, we executed some, some orders and we have the quantity was 90. So 10 is left. So the quantity remaining will be 10 because this was 100, this was 90. So that's 10. If our order happened to be limit order, if it was IOC, that's it. We don't execute anymore. We don't put order on a book. But if it's a limit, we put the order on a book using this add, you know, add order. This add side is the name of a side here. So instead of side, I have match side and add side. So match side is a side to against which we, we match the order, and add side is a side against on, on which we rest the remaining quantity of the order, right? Now, this match order, if we look in the, the concept, will accept the, uh, the order, right? So it has to be functions that accept an order reference and returns something that converts to quantity. So it can be implicitly convertible to quantity. It can be proxy type or something. Add order has been expanded with quantity type. So because now we don't put the full order, we just put some portion of it. So we need to say, whatever was executed. So we subtract that from the order and we say, this is how much we wanna leave on the book, right? Let's go back to the side. So we renamed it, remember, to stack of order queues book side. And this side now has a match order function and this match order function takes an order and does a loop. Okay, I'm not gonna go over the algorithm itself. I, keep, I think you can understand the algorithm. It's a, it's a loop. Uh, we go over all levels and we start from the first level at the top. So the best either bid or ask, and we go down, 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 down. And then the orders that we matched, we remove with this erase here, right? So the approach is to just iterate first and erase afterwards, maybe more efficient because if we keep erasing, we keep changing the collection, the, the deck or the vector, whatever that is. Um, and if we if we just iterate, then then we simply erase a whole range at once. So that could be more efficient, right? Cool thing about this approach is this is a hierarchical approach. So we start from order book. We accept an order. We say, okay, if it's a buy, we're gonna be matching against the ask and putting on the bid the reminder. Then do accept order, takes the match side and outside matches against the match side, takes the remaining quantity and puts the remaining quantity on the add side. And then if this match order in the uh, book side, right, is doing the loop over the levels. And then for each level, it calls match order on the level. So you have this hierarchy of call. So you have this single responsibility. Remember solid principles, the first principle say, Single responsibility. The responsibility of the book side is to, you know, know its levels. It's not the responsibility of the book side to know, you know, how to manage the level inside the level. We we go into the level, and the level now knows how to manage the orders in the level. So this way we have this nicer, easier to manage uh, algorithm, right? Because now at the level, we need to scan through orders at this level. So we have this loop here at the level, so that's our order price level. 
remember that order price level has this, you know, the Q type, which we defined here. So that's a Q type, our template parameter, for example, deck, and we iterate over that. So we start from the first element, we iterate, and again, I do arrays at the end. So I could be popping one after another, but that would not be as efficient is if I just iterate. And when I finish iterating, I just erase the whole range, right? So, so that's my iteration to, to match against the level. So I match some quantity that came in of the original order. So this is the incoming order. Let's say the quantity was 100, right? So in the beginning, this will be 100. And we keep matching. And on this level, we match, let's say, 50. So the quantity field will be 50, right? Because 100 minus 50 is 50. So we, we filled quantity of 50 in this loop. And the remaining quantity, we go back to the side. We make a next iteration here, or next uh, iteration. And we go back to this uh, order price level with the next level. This will be the next level. And we iterate to get another 50. And on this level, we feel, let's say, 30, right? So we return that we feel 30, and the remaining is 20. We go back here and the iteration ends because there is no more levels on this side. So what happens next? We exit match order saying the quantity that was uh, that was filled was 80, 80 and the remaining is 20. So what happens next here in the order book is we got the remaining quantity 20. So if our limit, if our order is limit order, then we put it back on the on the book. So we go to the side, which is the opposite side of the book. So it's not the same side. It's the opposite side of the book, so different object. And OK, it's the same uh, same type of the object, right? It's actually not the same because it, they are templated. Uh, you know, they, they have different template parameters, as you see. But there's the same order book side type, which is different template parameters. So technically, there are different types, right? So we, we call order, add order on a, an object of a different type that we call match order. These are two different data types, even though they have same code because it's a template. And then we call this add order on the on this side here, which does do add order, which obviously calls this uh, you know lower bound at the end to find the insertion point for the new level if there is a need for that. And then um, and then it calls add order on the level, which goes to again the price order price level. Add, add, add order and we add it into the into the queue. So you can see that we have this hierarchy. We go from order book, order book side, price level, and then we go back and then again order book, order book side, price level. We have this hierarchy. Our code is very well, uh, you know, contained. Every single piece of our code has one responsibility. It is very easy to uh, capture the essence of each function. So you don't have a mix of conditions. You don't have an interleaved code. You have a code where you have everything elegant uh, put in place, like a small, you know, small as possible chunks, right? So this match order does one thing, it just matches order. It, 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 it goes over what? It goes over orders, it's just that. Uh, this, this, this level, this uh, side here, goes over over the levels on the side, right? So it it it, it matches it matches you know levels and so on against the order. So th there is this single responsibility rule here that's preserved. At the next stage I have decided to try maybe coroutines because you know I promised coroutines. We have concepts uh, we can have coroutines now. So where do I use coroutines? We remember we were matching orders and we didn't do anything about those orders. We didn't report an execution. How about we make it a generator, right? So we call match order and it returns a generator of execution. And then we can, you know, iterate over those generated executions and like print them or something. So so yeah, that's 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 a interesting use of, of a of a generator and coroutine, right? So in order book, I say that accept order is now uh, returning a generator. And it it still forwards, it still forwards the uh, the order into the do accept order. So it, it forwards the parameters in. I also came up with another thing called execution policy. So I came up with, okay, we're gonna do two things with coroutines. One is we enumerate executions as they come. And second thing is 
during the executions, we, we, we will apply execution policy in asynchronous manner. So every time we have a match with an order, we will await on execution policy to evaluate if this execution can be you know, approved or not. So that is additional perk of this solution that we have this execution policy. Execution policy is some, you know, some template parameter here that we pass in. So let's see what happened here. We accept this, uh, I accept this execution policy in our do accept order. Somewhere here, oh, here we go. And it's here and we return a generator. And to have a generator in this function, we coil execute. So why do we need to coil? Why can we not just return? Uh, because we have split execution between match order and add order. So we first have to yield to the caller all the executions before we can add the order to the book, right? So what happens is matching engine match match will happen first. We'll keep matching orders, and this matching will not happen in this line. Okay. This matching will not happen in this line. This matching will happen on the go. So now this match order does not return quantity executed because at this stage, we have no clue what was the quantity executed. We didn't yet generated all the executions, so we don't know how many will be there. So it, this algorithm is suspended. This loops there, there was a loop over levels and loop over orders in the queue, they are suspended. They don't actually iterate. They just suspended and they wait until I call core yield. And then I'm calling core yield and I'm unsuspending one iteration, okay? And this keeps going and I accumulate this quantity that was you know, executed and then I know how much was executed. But I'm yielding to a caller. So before I do that, caller gets an execution and can do something with it. Can, for example, put it into some, you know, uh, to, to keep it high performance, you, I wouldn't be processing it. It'd be like put into some queue maybe for for some later time to use or do something with it that's lightweight, not too heavy because we are affecting the speed of this of this thing, right? Same execution policy does affect the speed. So it would need to have some kind of cached value so in it. So we can pass here as execution policy some reference to an object having some information about, for example, users, orders, instruments, you know, and when we execute, this may do some cache lookups to say, oh, this execution can happen. This execution has to be clipped and so on. So this is what we do with this execution policy here. Uh, I have implemented a no operation execution policy, which does nothing. Where did I st state it? I stated it here, a no operation execution policy. And I also implemented um, immediate execution policy, which does not do anything async. It, it's just the async call to co -await. It just comes back with the value. That's it. It does not do anything. Okay, let's see what we did to price level stack, right? All right. So this is the price level stack. So I used previously name stack of order queues. And I just like, this name is too long. I'm going to use price level stack instead because it makes more sense to me. So the, I renamed this to this new name. And now this function here, instead of returning quantity type, so the red one is removed, it returns a generator, okay? It returns a generator and it takes this execution policy double ampersand. And you can see this magical construct of, you know, C++, new C++. You can pass a default, you know, construct default type on this side. Um, and cool thing is that default of what? Because this is a type parameter. So if by default I was having like no operation one, you know, but I'm actually passing something else and that will construct something else if I put in triangular brackets something else. So this is actually cool that it it, it initializes whatever is this type. Now, we do this uh, matching of, of, the, of the levels. So we go over the levels, starting from the top level, best, best price level, best bid, best ask. And instead of calling match order and getting the quantity field, we now get this result, which is a generator. And this generator, uh, you know, has a Boolean 
uh, operator. So we can do while res. So we can go and check, is there a value? Is there a value? And if there is a value, then we call this and say, get me next one, get me next one. And this gives us the, this is the next value that we get from this generator. So this initiates the asynchronous algorithm. And this will pick next value from this algorithm. And then we yield this value back to the user, to the order book, and then to the user. And then we increment our counter so that we know how much value was executed. And we keep looping until this goes down to, actually, this goes up to order dot quantity, right? Unless we can fill and then we return. Uh, so price level has a queue of orders um, of this queue type. And we iterate over this queue, OK? I think this was added by mistake. Um, so we start from the top of like beginning of the queue, right? From the first order that came at this price, we iterate. And what we do here is we clip the order to either the quantity of rem remaining quantities that we're trying to fill or the quantity on the order that's in that queue. So if, if, the, if the quantity that we're trying to fill is 10 and the order in the queue has five, then obviously we can only execute five and the remaining five goes carries over to the next order in the queue. If we're trying to execute five and the order is 10, then we execute five because we only ordered five, right? If we match the quantity, we just execute both fully. Now we apply this execution policy. Execution policy can do something to this execution and say, oh, I don't like this order. I, I, you said you wanted to execute like 10, and uh, we will only execute five, right? So the execution policy will trim the order, for example. And this way, we know that we have to execute more. We continue with the algorithm, and we yield. So you can see there is two asynchronous calls here. One is call await. So we await execution policy to make a decision on the execution. And second, so that is one that we are the, um, the awaiter. And this is the situation when someone else is awaiting for our value. So we've been called by this price level stack and price level stack is awaiting for us to give us this next execution, right? So this goes back to our parent, uh, but this 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 is creating our child. So we are kind of between our parent and our child. We kind of like going and child give us the uh, executed, you know, quantity and then, okay, this is our execution go to parent, right? It, and it keeps going like this. So it's like two wheels that we're rotating on the, both sides. It's like cranking, cranking two wheels. This is what coroutines are like, cranking wheels like this. So yeah, so this is what happens here. So in some next coming, I did some improvements. Um, so here we were passing executed, uh, you know, this, this object to execution policy and nowhere it wasn't specified whether like it could be copied somewhere like you know and we didn't want to this object to be copied of course it wasn't it was a reference there in execution policy accepting the object by reference but we wanted to be more explicit we wanted to give the user of this execution policy the power to say i want a reference i want to make sure that i'm passing a reference and i don't copy this object under no condition so there is this STD ref that wraps this into a reference wrapper. And I did the um, changes for this. As you can see uh, now, I actually added even the, the concept somewhere, this argument to callable. It's added here in util. Uh, here we go. I just say that the T and F, so the T is a, is a type of argument to a callable F. So F is a function type. And T is its first argument, one argument. So you can see that if we have some F, so the decal of F, so this is kind of the opposite way of doing it. So normally you have X like this X dot something, but in here, in this concept, we have it backwards. So we say uh, there is some F that will accept our X, right? So that, that's our, that's our you know, concept for an argument to a function. So we say that uh, our operator with type T has the T has to be an argument to this F, which is you know type template type for to um, 
to this async immediate, right? You can see the type F is a type of this template type for this async immediate. And we store this F inside this async immediate. So we want to make sure that when we call with operator, so you see, I don't, I don't say here comma and the argument type, I just say operator and that's a template. So we could theoretically pass anything as this T and we say it has to be an argument for to F as a call F. And I pass it by this double reference and I use forward. So this way, you know, types get nicely forwarded. Not 100% sure if this is required because at the end of the day, I want to store a copy of this um, of this X in my awaitable because this apply, what it does, it creates an awaitable, right? For the co-await. I forward this X there and it initializes this X using storage type trait, right? But, um, but yeah, the good question is, you know, I, I, like it's it's a proper way of doing it, right? But we, we need a copy here. So at the end of the day, we keep forwarding this reference until it becomes a copy. Um, the storage type trait was necessary for the other ones, the generator as well, because some types don't have a default constructor. Uh, and because some types don't have this default constructor, then there is some issues with are we looking at our promise type? Yeah, so so that's that's still generator. There's a lot of red and green. I, I can barely see what's going on here. So so yeah, this promise type, you see, so we store the value, and this promise type is like when there is no value yet initially, then 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 this has to be default constructed. So I introduced this storage T so that you know. For types that cannot be default constructed, I still want to have a generator, and I don't want to say generator of some wrapper around the type. How about I make this policy here that will, you know, be smart enough to figure out what the type should be, wrap it around internally, and then I just say I just want to type T, and you know, go figure out. And here's my uh, value storage trait, where I say, okay, if it is stored stored by value. Okay, if it is stored by value, then use, use T as it is, don't change it. But maybe I should use a decoy type, but you know, decoy type of T would be just T and it would remove the references. Um, the optional T is gonna be used if it cannot be stored by value, right? So stored by value, I'm using uh, the value of is default constructible. That's a, that's a trait from standard library. I say, if it is default constructible, then I can store it by value. So perfect. If 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 it's not default constructible, I just wrap it with optional. So it doesn't actually change much because optional simply, you know, takes mostly similar amount of space, maybe slightly more to, to mark it as it is there or not, but there is no pointers involved, no memory allocation involved. It's just on, you know, value type. Um, the benefit of that is that we don't default construct the object. So optional can store a T, but can also store no T. And it means that, um, you know, if there's no object, we don't construct it. There's no need for default constructor. If there is an object, we just construct it with parameters and there is no need to have a default constructor either. So we're happy with both, you know. So here we go, there's an extract value a template which requires that type and X are the same. Why did I make it a template? I made it a template because this double reference here works completely differently if it is a template and it works differently if it is not a template. Even though this is a template, if this is this function is not a template, you know, then this will be a concrete type T, right? For, for given type T this, of this structure, this function would have a concrete type T and that would be double reference to that, that type T would meaning that you cannot pass, uh, you know, persistent reference because that would imply that you try to move from object that you are not moving. You didn't use std move, so you cannot move. But if you use template, then magic happens and uh, you can pass here, whatever you want. <laughs> so that's, 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 that's a fun thing about templates. So I added this, 
requires is the same v because i want x and t to be the same type you know you just want the compiler to to be more like to be to be more gentle with this double double reference and then i use const expression again another case for const expression if case uh, so instead of having you know specialization of this template um, i just create one and I say const expression, if if this is my case, then this is my case, and this if this is my case, this is my, you know, simple, irreadable. You read that code and like, yeah, straightforward, simple, couldn't be any simpler, right? So so yeah, so that's super cool. In generator, yeah, we already went through that. Um, so I'm using this extract, uh, extract value here, right? An extract value is giving me back the same type uh, as you know as I put in. So, if I was uh, if I was putting in uh, the the reference to an object, uh, it would give me reference. It will not give me const reference or something. So I can I can actually move it. So I can I can take do the move of this value. And if I apply move to have a promise value uh, to to extract it to extract it. Uh, Type right. So let's let's look at this again. So if it's an option, right? If it's an option, if I do star object, this star object has overload. As we can see, it has an overload like this. It returns t ampersand ampersand, meaning that I can actually move the thing outside of the option. I can steal the thing from the option. That's cool. That's very well taught, I'd say. So this way, I can you know, I can use this std move. Uh, where is that? Move. Where did you go? Here it is. std move. I can move this, uh, this, you see, I take this value of promise, but it's, I have to forward it into this extra value. And that will give me, you know, if it's an option, uh, that will give me double reference to the, to the inside of this option, which will be this actual value. And then I move it out so that it's no longer in the promise. And the promise become, has now option without value. An option becomes uninitialized. This is just fantastic. So as I have uh, said earlier, um, you know, you learn as you go, and you. I found out that you know what, this awaitable is constructed only once ever. Uh, when you call apply, we construct awaitable. We never default construct it, so there is no need for the storage type here. The storage type trait is for the uh, you know default constructible, and it's this this t. It will not be default constructed ever. And to make sure that it will not, I created this constructor, explicit constructor that says this awaitable can only be constructed like this. There's no other constructors. This is the only place that constructs it. And we are 100% sure that that's what happens. And we always move, we always move this f and x. So this way it's relatively efficient, simple, and we don't use traits anymore for things that we don't have to. And, you know, because uh, because it is uh, actually actually we are we are trying to create a type trait for default constructible. I thought it would be reasonable to change the name from from value storage trait to default constructible wrapper. Right, this way it's kind of more um, kind of more understandable what it is because it's a wrapper for things that are not default constructible. So it just makes sure that the type you're passing in is default constructible. It just wraps it with option, right? So something that is not default constructible will be just an option. And here we have another use of const expression. Um, I added Boolean checked flag to my default constructible wrapper. So std option has two options. You can use dot value or dot or star. You can use star if you don't want to check if value is in the option, or you can use dot value if you want to throw error if there is no value in there. So I changed it to, to checked true, and from now on I'm using this checked version. But yeah, this default constructible has this parameter now, and depending what you put here, we get one of the other option, and it is compile time because it's a const expression. So I promised to talk about how did I solve the problem of second order concepts because they don't exist in C20. There's concepts, there's second order templates, but there's no concepts for second order templates. And what can we do about that? Well, there is something we can do about it. It's not perfect, but this is how I did it. So at, st at this stage, I cannot put a concept here and say the Q-type has to be, you know, a concept of a template. 
But what I can do is here, I can make require statement, which says I require that this expression is true. And the expression will be true. I'm saying, okay, maybe I don't, I cannot have, have it as a template, but maybe I can pass this here. And this is Q is a template, you know, template uh, function. And template functions can accept second, can be second order templates, right? So I can put here a template type as a parameter. And here I can put a specific type, which I know in my class or the price level, this will be our type T of my, in my queue of elements I'm storing. And this is queue is gonna do magic inside. And I'm gonna show you what is it doing there. So let's see. So here's the is queue. So I'm using this, um, this trick, okay? So is Q is a struct. The first template parameter is a template type. And the second template parameter is some type. So you can say is Q with some type without specifying the type you know, of the element. And it will just default to int. So if it's good for your type, maybe it's good for int too. So stack of ints is as good as stack of floats. You know, it's still a stack. So that's one approach to do it. But uh, what, what if you passed, uh, instead of std deck, maybe you passed something that has specialization and depending what is the type, it specializes as set and or specializes as a list. And then how do you know it works for, like you say it works for int, but it doesn't work for something else. And here we go, we have a problem, right? So I wanted to make sure that the type that we pass in is not the type that just works for int. So you can check default by for int but if if we, if you know what the a could be you can pass it here and i created a q concept so a q concept is here we go i made it a concept with second parameter so it's the closest thing you can get to second order concepts but it's not a second order concept because this t here is not a template type it would have to be a template type and it's not unfortunately this is a template type and this is a regular type so what do I need to do to use this concept? Well, I have to create this type somewhere. How do I make it happen? I create two specializations. Well, I, I create a new 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 struct test and a specialization of test for S. So default uh, default uh, you know implementation of, of struct test will will just have be std false. So there is a uh, there is a false type and true type in standard library now. So you don't have to define these, uh, you know, enum value whatsoever is expression. You can just say, yeah, it has a Boolean false inside. This one has a Boolean true inside, you know. So I, when I say value, it just says true or false. That's it. It's a const expression true and a const expression false. And uh, you, you just, you know, extend this type like this. So by default, test is false type. But the specialization for type S where S must satisfy Q concept is true type. So we're taking advantage of new C++ 20. You know, we, we used to have Sphina and this is even able, terrible stuff. We don't have to do that now because if we do this, this gets matched and compiler will say, you know, you'll be passing STD deck. STD deck matches that. So compiler says, does STD deck match this concept, right? We're passing, we're passing of A, right? We have this A here and T. So we say a Q concept, right? A Q concept of A. Does S match Q concept of A? So A will be some level, price level. So, oh, sorry, uh, in, in if it is Q concept, that would be like a, it would be order quantity, right? That would be order quantity for order type. So that does, does this S match the concept of, <clears throat> <clears throat> Does this S match concept of uh, a Q concept with with this or the quantity as a template parameter, right? So how do we even get that uh, S, right? How do we even create one? Well, it's very simple. These are just you know structs with template parameters, and what I'm having at the end is this value which is test with T of A. So we just say we want to make a test in which we actually create an instance of 
this template type, passing A as a template parameter. So this TA is, is the type we're testing. And this TA now we're testing against this concept. And then, you know, if it doesn't match against the concept, we return false type. If, if it does match against this concept, then we have a true type. And then in this require statement, we saw that, which we hopefully scroll to soon. See this require statement. We have this value here extracted and we say, okay, we cannot proceed with this class unless this is true. So at this stage, at this line, we know, okay, we have some template type here, okay? That's actually random stack. The queue was just here, right? So we have that, that template type here as a parameter, but here we can say, okay, we use the template type, but we also know how we will, you know, create the elements, what will be the elements of this queue, and we can make a test to say this is a queue. And if that is satisfied, we are perfect to go. It's, it's not as nice as if I were to say here, oh, it could be a queue concept. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. But now I'm gonna show you how to build this project. It's available on GitHub, you can clone it if you want, and you can test it for yourself. So how do you do that? You need a Docker desktop, okay? And uh, what you need to do is Docker, um, compose, up, minus D. And that will launch the container. You can see the container is running here, okay? Now you can enter the container. So use this from this bash script, which does this. It just executes bash in a, inside the container and you stay in there. So let's go in. Yeah, here we are, we're inside the container. Then um, in the home directory, you create a build folder. I did it because for good reason. The, the actual source code is in app, okay? The, what I cloned from Git and in the build folder, I have, you know, my build and configuration. I didn't want to do it inside the app because then I don't have a conflict with my, you know, Git repo as well. I don't have to expose it to my host machine, right? Because I'm inside container. So I can keep my build inside the container. I don't have to expose it. Only things that are in the app are exposed uh, via mounted volume. So let me go to build a uh, home build. Okay. Now, what do you do here? You just run CMake and home app, right? So I already did it before, so I don't know what it will do now. It will probably say everything is fine. And once you do it, it will generate you the make files and stuff. So you can do make. When you do make, it will build everything. I have already built things before, so I guess you're here. You can run test with C test. They all pass. So I made road tests for, for the order book and for the async. And you can run um, what's that called? Run app. That's mine. And this is a simple app that demonstrates how the order work works. It's just for you to understand how to use this, uh, this library, right? If you, want, if you wanted to try it for whatever reason. I want to just remind you that the license is GPL, so commercial use is prohibited. Um, so we see here some prints. User number one wants to buy five at price 100. User number two wants to sell immediately 10 at price 95. Matched order of user two and user one. The executed quantity is five and price is 100. Everything is correct. Sounds like it. Um, yeah, so that's a simple program output. How does the program look inside? We can go to main and see for ourselves. So the program is quite straightforward, right? So as I said, we can define our own order type. I did it by doing, uh, by inheriting, extending the order type like this. I could as well do something like this. I don't have to do that because it's a concept and concept does not require to extend any type. You can just say, I want to have price, okay? I want to have quantity and so on. And you keep going, right? But uh, for my convenience, you know, it's it was more convenient for me to do it like this. Also, if I wanted price to be, for example, double and quantity to be, for example, long, this is how I can do it, right? And then my price will be double, quantity will be long. It's probably more likely that you would use like this, 
uh, because maybe uh, maybe you have quantity which is fractional and maybe the price is like fixed point or something. Maybe you have some, you know, some magic decimal type and some magic, you know, quantity. Some types you defined in your library that are like this and, you know, they have basic arithmetic and you can use them. This is my order book. My order book in this case is just an order book that uses my order, okay? I could here specify some different policy, right? Some different different order book site policy. Um, I don't have any. I could I could create a different one, but I could I could I could you know. So I so so this is my my order book. So this is my order book, and as you can see, this is just you know order book with my order. I could put here a policy. So let's let's check what order book looks like. Uh, order book order book right and maybe maybe i just use this order book policy right but maybe i will uh, we need to put a namespace here i i made an abbreviation here of namespace so scythecraft uh order book scope cited so scope price of a policy now this needs to have two parameters here and then maybe i want to say std uh, vector of of std vector why not? So this is going to be vector of vectors. It's not going to be super efficient, right? But it should still work. It should still compile because vector is random accessible. And then we have vectors. So let's let's see if that works actually. Maybe it won't. Surprise, it compiled. What happens if I say I want to put here std list, right? We know that list is not randomly accessible. So Expecting error. Oh, well, we have an error. And the error isn't such a bad error because it actually tells us somewhere there that so we have is random stack value. This has not been satisfied, that requirement. And now we know, okay, unfortunately, my list does not satisfy is random stack. I don't know why is that the case. Let me check. Random stack. Oh, random stack requires me to have in place and minus begin and from. So this and minus begin is my way to say this collection supports uh, iterator difference. So you, you can only do the iterator difference and arithmetic of iterators. So this is an arithmetic of iterators only if it's random accessible. If it's not random accessible, like list, you cannot just say one iterator minus second iterator because this doesn't, this is not possible, right? We don't know how many items are between those two iterators unless we use some kind of, you know, iteration to find it out. So, so this way we say, okay, this is not possible, right? Must be able to jump to random location. Let's go back to um, our, um, our main. So we know that list is not going to work. Let's use... Uh, deck of vectors, right? Maybe let's use deck of lists. Why not to try this? So that one potentially could work, right? And it does work. And we can check if the app still, oh, it still shows the same thing. Nothing changed. We're just using now deck of list. So you can see how, how you can use policy-based uh, templates, right, to to, you know to choose to choose what what container types you want to use in your in your order book for example in this case or other other solutions right so you don't need to make a decision at the beginning saying i'm going to make it a deck well here it doesn't matter we can change it to deck list vector we have three choices we can implement our own choice um, as well ourselves right as long as it it conforms to this concept here, as long as it is following this concept. So we can maybe implement your own data structure for whatever reason. So what is the code doing? This is very simple code. We have just two orders, buy and sell. So I'm using this nice initializer for the uh, arrays in C++. So we can use you know these curly brackets to initialize the things. And uh, next, I just go over those orders. 
So this is a very nice new syntax from C++ to do this colon thing over the range of things. And it knows how many elements are there, which is super cool because this is an array. How does it know that it's two, not four, not five? You know, in all times we had to do magic to know how many elements are in array. Um, so yeah, it does iterate over elements and for every order in these orders, it just does something like this book accept order. And we remember that book accept order is giving us a generator. So we send one order and then we get back a generator for executions. So the next execution is our generator for next of executions. And we keep looping until this next execution is Boolean true. So this means there is a next execution. Conversion to Boolean says, yes, there is. And here we get this next execution. So we just go into the generator says, hey, I want this next, I want this next execution, right? And as a result, we're getting this next execution object, which we print. So for the first order, there won't be anything. So we go again. And for the second order, we will have an execution and we say mash something. And we can see here, there's an output saying mash an order and voila. And that's, that's how simple this is. You can see how, you know, not complicated this order book, which lots of templates, um, and concepts and coroutines, but as a user, as a user of it, look how happy I am. Look, I'm just doing this. This is, this is me as a user. This is C++ and looks like Python. <laughs> you know, it, it does look like Python a bit, like this type here, maybe like new Python has types. So, you know, it's, it's almost same. Like if I were to write it in Python, it wouldn't look much different. So. But it's all because of templates. It's because of concepts and templates. So let's have one more look at the concept there. So our order book. So now I split files into two folders. There is more generic util and there's order book. So concepts in order book are the concepts relating to order book stuff. So we have execution policy now. We say execution policy has to have be you know, executable with some, some parameter A which will be returning awaitable concept in the util defined, which is uh, here, awaitable defined as all these methods that it has. I'm surprised that I couldn't find in standard library awaitable concept. There is uh, missing things there, to be honest. The, the, the generator, I I know it's in C++ 23. So it, it's, it's, it's not yet there in 20, it's in 23. Uh, it wasn't working for me when I uh, changed here the version 23, but uh, yeah, it, it is in a CPP reference mentioned that in, C, in C++ 23 should be there. Um, so generator, I had to copy paste from CPP reference. I added a little bit of my flavor to support this uh, default constructible thing, this one. So that's my addition to it. And um, there is also this, which is my addition to it to extract the value, right? If that, that would be it for the so for the generator. So yeah, so we have this array table concept returned from, you know, from execution policy, the execution of it. And now we know that we can co wait on it. We have this order concept saying that there is a side type price quantity. We have this order quantity concept that says there is an order function returning concept, uh, returning something that's an order type, right? So this order type here is a, is a parameter to this order quantity concept. So we actually didn't, didn't do the concept check uh, for the order concept here. And uh, when you define concepts, you cannot put, I wouldn't like, I cannot put it here. I cannot put here concept. That will not work. Okay, if I do that, I get an error something to work on in the next version of C++. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for improved C++ at this stage. Um, now, next thing is the generator concept, which uh, we know that it can be called to give you back the element. And we can see that it, it, the, the return value matches a concept. 
I couldn't make it a generic concept of generator because I wouldn't be able to put here a concept. I wouldn't be able to say, you know, I want, I don't want a type name. I want concept name. You want to say, this is a second order concept generic. I want to say this, this concept is accepting a concept as a parameter. Well, I cannot do that. So, so this is, this is what I have here. Um, order book side concept. We can see that there is other order, match order. And uh, here we have this problem, another problem, because I have to decal val of some type for my template parameter of match order, which is execution policy. So I would love to say, give me something, please, that satisfies execution policy concept. DRC++, when I'm compiling this, I would like to say decal val of a concept execution policy concept instead of saying I have something that I think matches this concept. Okay. I would like to not use a you know concrete type here because the whole the whole idea I think is to not use them, right? It's just stick to the concept and you know concepts are the best. Where is that? I lost it. I have lost the thing, I must say. Now ah, here we go. So I passed the async nope. I'm passing async nope instead of give me the value of that concept. Synthesize, synthetize a type that matches the concept. <laughs> you know, it's not there. Um, but it's there for me to return the generator. That's cool. So at least I can do that. But again, I have to pass order type here and I cannot say that I want to have just generator that is returning the, you know, this concept. I want to, I want it to return the code concepts. I don't want it to return types, but I cannot do that. Um, price level concept, price level order book site concept, price level order book concept. That's, I did for testing. So if you look at my tests, my test is now a, a template and, um, this is my test, okay? So I actually run the same test with different, you know, with different types for my price and quantity, trying to check if this all works correctly. And, uh, you know, I wanted to just say the order book that I'm passing here into this test has to be this price level concept because of the way I'm accessing it. I'm using bid, right? So again, concept should define, it's like interface segregation. What do I use? in this, uh, I'm this function, I'm using this and this, right? So this, this concept here has to give me what I'm using. I don't want it to give me things that I don't use. I want it to give me things that I do use. And I use accept order, I use bid, I use, uh, I use ask as well, and so on. I use top of the, of the bid, right? So I want this to be in my concept. And I say, this is the price level concept. Now the order book does not have it because order book does not need it. If you look at the order book, do accept order, accept order book site concept for the match site and for the add side side, add side type. Because this is the only thing it uses, match and add. So this, this, this function here only needs to match and add. It doesn't need, it doesn't need to get beads or ask. It doesn't need anything like this. It just needs to match or add, right? It's possible that some additional methods might be required when, I don't know, more functionality I'll be adding. But uh, yeah, at this stage, it's not required. So it's not there. So my price level concept is having properties of a price level for my test. So first, uh, first order in the queue, last order in the queue, first order like this, total quantity of the level and price. I don't assume that this is iterator. I don't care. I just say that I can start it. And when I start it, I get the value. I could require that it is an iterator, but I could just say it's whatever concept of iterator. It's maybe I should make it a concept of iterator, but then I, how would I know how I would have to define a concept of the order quantity concept, you know, iterator. And because I cannot pass this thing as template parameter, remember, I couldn't do that for the generator, I couldn't pass here, I couldn't pass here a concept. 
So for iterator, I will be able to do the same thing. So I just like, okay, too much thinking about it. This is good enough, <laughs> right? This is good enough. And perhaps for generator, I could do something similar. Maybe I could, instead of returning much generator concept, maybe I could say, I don't know, just, just apply this operator, you know, what happened here? I think it's correct. And then expect, you know, expect something like this, right? So so if I if I do apply operator on generator, I should get an instance of the quantity, right? So that's the concept. We're not actually executing anything. We're just saying the type will be like this. There will be a operator that is, you know, instead of doing that. But but we will not do that. Okay, I'll just leave it like it is because this one is better requirement than the other one. But for the iterators, I just skipped it because like I cannot have a concept with the concept. So that's that's just not working. And we do have templates and template parameters to the templates and those parameters are concepts. So we need to be able to somehow pass concepts to the concepts. And yeah, so we have the book and so on and that's it, so voila, that's our concept. And actually by looking at the concepts, you know how to use this library. You don't have to like, go through this and like, what the hell Sonia did here? We don't understand that. This is so complicated. Oh my God, ah, my head is in pain. You don't have to understand anything because you can go to concepts file and concepts file will tell you what you expect. You know, you just, you were just told, okay, I have this order book. Where is the concept for order book? Well, there probably is no concept for order book because I didn't need a concept for order book because order book is here and it has this 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 method accept order perhaps uh, you know an order book concept could be added but what would be the purpose of it i'm not using order book as a template however you could be using order book as template parameter for your code and that would mean that you would like to say i want to use something that satisfies order book concept and maybe you know switch from this to some mock or something and you know, then then it makes actually sense to add order book concept here. So maybe I'll add it later on so that you know it's com com it's a uh, complete solution, right? We do have the price level order book concept, so we should probably have a you know just an order book concept that has the the, the things that we need, right? But as we can see by looking at the concept uh, list of concepts, we can easily figure out what is what. We can say, okay, this is this is what order should be. We have the types defined in the order, like everything. If if there is things, other things in the order, well, we cannot do like it's making bad assumptions about types because it wasn't required. So why are we assuming they are there, right? We should be only assuming about our data that is conforming and the classes that they conform to those concepts or interfaces. So you know, here we the only thing we know about this order is this. That's it. That's all we know. We cannot know more. That's that's our knowledge of a concept. Execution policy concept. So whatever we have, the class on our side, uh, we just need to pass something. It it needs to have this operator. That's it. We know, and it's so simple now to like implement those templates, right? So even though like you know those those error messages, right? These are nicer error messages because look how this error message, it starts here, right? And how many screens is that? I just mark the beginning of the screen, the end of the screen. Let's see how many screens. That's one screen, that's second screen, just two screens, okay? Two screens compared to 100 screens in, you know, a long time ago in C++ 98. So two screens versus 100 screens. And you have this red things, and you have this you know blue things. And the blue things are the ones that are interesting, right? So when something is blue, this probably requires. And that's pretty cool because now we know, okay, we didn't satisfy the requirement. It would be nice if GCC was actually making, if, if it's a reason it requires, if, if it didn't print all that, if it just, it just printed, look, there is this requires not satisfied, that's it. That's the all information you need to know because you know I really don't need to read that. <laughs> you know, all I need to know is this. Okay. And perhaps you want to tell me what was the type here, what was the type here? I don't know. 
I don't know, verbosity of these error messages are really big and it's hard to find anything here. But yeah, sometimes it's good to know what happened because it could be like, oh, I made a mistake. Where is the mistake? I don't know. So maybe sometimes it's useful. And also those, I'm not sure why I get this red stuff here. Once the concept is not satisfied, um, you know, Oh, because yeah, it just tells me that they don't satisfy the concept. That's that's why. So, so that that's that's what what we need to know. So yeah, so that's so that's the uh, the concepts. And uh, with regards to coroutines, they're also very simple. We are very familiar with them from uh, like C sharp, TypeScript, maybe maybe new Python has async as well. And Python always had the generators, so. In here, we have a mix of both. This is generator, but it's also async. So you can see there is a co-await, co-yield, and uh, you know, it's everything you need to know. So co-await on the execution policy. Co the, the only thing you need to know about co-await, you need to have uh, something that's, you know, this uh, implements this concept, right? Something that implements a wait table concept. That's all you need. Uh, a wait table concept can have different methods. Maybe that's why it's not specified in standard library because um, depending what you're doing, right? Depending on what you're doing. Um, so in this particular code uh, on this execution policy, so, so this operator, if you look at this execution policy, this isn't anything that, <laughs> that uh, co-await requires, right? This is just this operator. It's like regular operator overload. Uh, it's important that it returns the wait table. That's it. Now, to call a wait on something, the wait table needs to do a wait suspend, right? And then it needs to have resume and ready. But to call yield, it's a different one, right? It has to be, you know, something like this. So it, it has this yield value. So that's different. If you you can actually do, I think both. You can have something that you await on and yield from, and you probably mix and match the, the calls, you know. So. I don't know. I never tried that. I have two set two different things because I I have them different, right? I have a generator, and I have this await table, async await table. So async await table is like just one thing. That's like a task. It's like, and again, this would be actually a task in new C plus plus twenty three. Um, maybe I should call it a task. I don't know. So so yeah. So that's that's it basically. That's that's the order book tour by by me. Uh, you know, for Transgender Day of Visibility 2023. Enjoy my work if you want. Comment, like, subscribe, or yeah, enjoy. <laughs>